day one of the Congressional Cup in Long Beach and the skippers are pumped. If you want to win, you have to beat them all. Uh, that's what we're aiming for. I think it's everything is about the crew work and uh, how the team is going to get to grow together. If we can develop as we think, uh, we're going to be really strong in the end. We're part of the Knots Racing Team, representing the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron. Um, this will be our second Con Cup. The first one we did was back in 2019. We're super excited to get back on the tour and um, give it a good nudge. We enjoy it a lot here. I think the York Club is doing, putting up an excellent event. Yeah, we're looking forward to a good uh, World Championship uh, event week. This is the Sailing World on Water, April 25th, 2022. Lake Garda is the scene for sailing's most wonderful regatta. Every Easter it's the World Optus' turn to turn the waters white. Usually around 1,100 young Opti sailors fight it out for the silverware. Followed by the 2022 World Championship hosted for the first time in Portoroz, Slovenia over the 12 to 16 October. To close the 2022 season in December, the 44 Cup will travel to the Middle East for the first time since 2014 hosted over the 7 to 11 December in Muscat, Oman. This year's Earth Day is encouraging everybody to invest in our planet. I'm Ellen. Um, I've been in Hong Kong for um, six years, originally from Sweden. And I'm Angus, I'm from Australia. I've been in Hong Kong for around uh, nearly 12 years now and um, been working in Hong Kong in the marine industry for that whole time. We started Clean Water Waste Initiative in 2019 with a mission to help clean up the waterways around Hong Kong and also prevent plastic from spreading out of our waterways um, into the ocean where it can have a really harmful effect on the marine ecosystems. I've been a club member for nearly 10 years now. I spend most days on the water working in the marine industry and have done for the uh, whole time in Hong Kong. Part of um, the project, we are trying to raise as much awareness as we can regarding marine plastic pollution and what can be done to solve the issue. So we're running a few different programs. Right now we're focusing on a harbour tour where we take students out. We allow them to see the problem firsthand. As club members that spend a lot of time on the water, it'd be great to see people picking up the plastic that floats by them in their boats when they're out and about, either sailing or rowing. The Pick Up Plastic program that Yacht Club runs internally is a fantastic initiative and that's really pushing members to get around and, and pick up plastic as they see on the water as well. Starting an NGO um, is fundamentally relatively easy, um, but we could never have gotten to where we are now without the support from so many different levels, from the government and from the wider community and of course HSBC who are helping us not just with funding, support on other levels like network and resources that they've always been very happy to share with us.
mise à l'eau 14 avril, ensuite 15 jours de navigation technique à l'Orient pour préparer les traversées de l'Atlantique qui auront lieu au mois de mai. On part début mai de l'Orient, direction la Guadeloupe, première traversée en faux solitaire. Pour moi, je vais naviguer avec quatre personnes avec moi. Arrivé en Guadeloupe au bout d'une semaine de traversée, on reste sur place une dizaine de jours et on repart vers le 20 mai, vers l'Europe. On s'arrête en aux Açores pour débarquer l'équipage qui sera avec moi à bord pour s'entraîner. Et je terminerai entre les Açores et l'Orient en solitaire pour faire ma qualification pour la route du Rhum. Donc une arrivée à l'Orient fin mai. Pour le mois de juin, c'est essentiellement des navigations prévues sur l'Orient avec des navigations techniques et préparer la première course de la saison qui va arriver début juillet. 1er juillet, départ de la Finistère Atlantique en équipage, en ultime, départ de Concarneau pour un grand tour direction Madère, ensuite les Açores, le Fastnet et retour à Concarneau vers le 7 juillet. Course réservée aux ultimes et si tout se passe bien, si on enchaîne l'ensemble de tout ce programme jusqu'au 10 juillet, le bateau sera sorti de l'eau quelques jours après, plus concentré sur une vérification de tous les systèmes avant d'attaquer la deuxième partie de la saison concentré sur la route du Rhum. Donc remise à l'eau du bateau début septembre ici à Lorient. Et là, on va enchaîner des navigations sur Lorient et surtout deux stages d'entraînement à Port-la-Forêt avec d'autres ultimes dans un mode faux solitaire en vue de la route du Rhum. Donc une présence à Saint-Malo pour le 24 octobre prochain et un départ de la route du Rhum le 6 novembre prochain. Pour un temps de course autour de 6 à 7 jours, le record est de 7 jours et une douzaine d'heures je crois. Et bien sûr l'objectif c'est d'arriver le premier. The Congressional Cup in Long Beach had lots of action. The lead commentator is Tucker Thompson. I think he sees a bit of a righty. All things being equal, you want to at least position yourself to the right of your opponent in a match race, right? Absolutely, and that's why you saw Chris Poole leading the tack going back to the right-hand side when they're attacking on the port to protect that right-hand side from Harry Price. And now it's a big split, so we're going to see whether the right pays off. Dennis is going to keep us informed whether the right or the left pays off for Price and Poole. Meanwhile, let's get back into the pre-start with the, uh, flight number three. And there's the dial-up. So boat number five is Nick Egnot Johnson from New Zealand. And just to windward of him on the left of your screen from Denmark is Jeppe Bork. We've been talking a lot about how well the Danish, young Danish teams maneuver these Catalina 37s, here we go again. Uh, they've been super aggressive all week, being able to throw these boats around like they're a little bit smaller than they actually are. They've had a, they've, they've impressed the crowd, as we like to say, with their boat handling as we 245, both boats sailing off on port. Now, Dennis, at this point, both boats on port have a little bit of time to kill. They're looking upwind, just like you are. The cross in the next match is going to be crucial. It's going to give important information, whether you think the right or the left is working. The right is working right now. Um, and there we go. You're, you're correct. Oh, that is a rare statement. It doesn't actually happen very often, I can tell you. So we like the right. Thank you, Dennis. Back into the pre-start, the teams will notice that. So over to you, um, Jeffrey. Yeah. You're, you're the helmsman. You know you want the right-hand side. You're going to lead or push? It's, it's an interesting interesting notion because you can, you can get the right side from both sides depending on how you play it. It's all about the time on the clock here. With 2.05 to go, it looks like Gepe Borsch is driving in front of Nick Egnot Johnson. Hard to see from our perspective right now. <laughs> We're locked out on the pier. Well, there they come. Look, now that'll give you an idea of just how close these boats are to the, well, one fan out there on the pier. Likely to build later this afternoon. Absolutely, and you can see you can see that orange mark just off the corner of the pier. That's the boundary that has been set, which is new to the Congressional Cup in the past two years. And Yepe just doing a really nice job, just killing a beautiful amount of time. 1.30 to go, and both boats still pretty far away from the line. Now, if Yepe, Yepe times this right, he'll be able to take the right-hand side despite what Nick does. So I think he's done a brilliant job so far, but he needs to keep doing a good job as the start comes to a close. Meaning, if his time on distance is better, he, he'll be able to tack on the port if he wants to once he gets down into the start box? Yeah, absolutely. And if, and if he doesn't like what he's seeing, I mean, we've seen, though, that Nick really likes that wide right start. He's been, he's been very comfortable hanging way up above the ley line, waiting for the other boat to pull the trigger, and then taking a quick start in and rolling straight into attack to get that right side. All right, let's see if that happens again. We're less than a minute to go to the start. Yepe Bork is leading. Nick Egnot Johnson, as you say, just comfortable to hang back to the right positionally. He wants the right upwind, as Dennis told us. And uh, 44 seconds to go. Yeah, 44 seconds to go, and he's having to continue to dip to push Yepe down the ley line here. And so maybe Nick feeling a little bit under pressure here. He doesn't have too much time to go, and both boats getting pretty close to the committee boat. 
That's the signal boat far right-hand side of your screen. It's the umpire coming into position as well, and boats are very close to ley line for the signal boat. I think Ignat Johnson's going to be able to get in there, unless Bork can close the door. Can he luff him up and shut out the Kiwis? And he definitely can luff him up there, but I don't think he can shut him out, but he can put the Kiwis in a really tough spot, and they can't tack and start on port, so they're going to have to start on starboard on his hip. And there's the gun. Yep, both boats pulling the trigger on the line now. Tight to windward is Egnat Johnson. He rolls immediately into attack. And then Yepe Borsch got to be a little careful to follow that tack immediately. It's really hard to live off of, a, of the hip of a boat like that because the wind effectively bounces off the lured boat sails onto boat one sails in this situation. So I'd expect to see Yepe roll into a pretty quick tack after this because I don't think he's going to be able to live. Was he trying to pin the... Uh Kiwis to lure it so they won't, they won't tack? Yeah, his strategy there is sail them all the way out to the ley line. If he can hang on to the ley line, when both boats get to the ley line, they're going to tack, and Nickel would be forced to sail and Yep his bad air all the way to the top mark, which should give him about a two-boat length lead. So perhaps a short-term loss is going to turn into a long-term gain the farther the boats go this way, if Bork can hang in that windward position. But as you say, easier said than done as the breeze picks up here in Long Beach. Head performance coach of Ineos Britannia, so Robbie Wilson discusses profile. rewriting the playbook. You don't want it to be too bold in my eyes. You don't want to rewrite the rule, but you want to keep the class progressing, which I, I really think this has done. The development of the playbook. If we looked at last cycle, the boat was very much a new concept. So we started with almost a blank piece of paper like, as to how we were going to sail the boat. This time round, we've got the advantage that we've, we've done a, a cycle ourselves. We've seen everyone racing. It's more of an evolution as opposed to a, a complete rewrite. Previously, when the jib was tacked, you basically had crew members that had to manually look after releasing the jib sheet and then taking the jib sheet on on the new side and, and loading it. So it took two of the grinders out of that, that loop. Now the jib is on a, a track, it's more automatic how the jib goes through from, from one tack to another. So that you know has implications as how you power the boat. Without giving too much away, you're obviously looking at the power requirements of the boat and what a cyclor can generate over someone using their arms and then where they might be able to input on the control side as well. There's some pretty big ticket items there that we're really thrashing through as a, as a sailing team with the design team and, and looking at the whole package and how we can make the fastest boat that we can boat handle effectively and race effectively. Recon in any Cup campaign is a massive part of the development and the racing. This time round, we have shared recon, which is a massive, massive change for the, for the Cup. So what it entails is each competitor has a recon team following them. And that observed competitor, they have to do pretty much everything they can to make it as easy as possible for the recon team to follow them. They have to provide them with a chase boat. They have to tell them when they're going sailing, when they're not sailing. At the end of the day, they're allowed where the boat is launching to take pictures close up, and then they're given interview time with the sailors and with the designers. So there's a huge amount of access to all the teams that we wouldn't have had before. It's going to open a lot of stuff up. It's going to be really interesting. The AC-75, it's an amazing bit of kit. Um, technically, it's massively challenging. I think we're going to see some refinements in the boat, some evolution, and it, it's going to yield some really exciting racing. Pip Hare is soon to race around Iceland, so she discusses her warm clothing. There are a number of challenges that we are trying to figure out solutions to uh, with this next new boat. Um, and part of it is to do with how quickly the boat can decelerate 
when it comes off the foils but also ploughs into a wave uh, and kind of at its most extreme I could be looking at a deceleration of b- around 15 miles an hour um, if the boat either hits something or comes to a hard stop in front of a wave so I'm considering using body armour on the boat uh, when conditions are like that um, definitely uh, a helmet um, but a friend has um, uh, donated this for me to try so this is motorcycle um, body armour it's got a back plate on it um, which I'll, I'll try I can unzip that and then shoulder protectors and wrist and arm protectors and I'm going to have a go at wearing this underneath my foul weather gear to see if I can move around to see how comfortable it is um, and maybe this is the solution for protecting myself when conditions are really bad.